Welcome to ACS Webinars, bringing you the best and brightest minds in chemistry live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. To view our upcoming schedule, please visit acs.org slash acswebinars. Hello, everyone. We're so glad to have you here for National Chemistry Week and our presentation today on sweet science. A little background on myself. I am trained as a bio-inorganic chemist, but today we're talking food and specifically candy. I also teach a class here at American University in Washington, D.C. on the chemistry of cooking. So I have a great interest in all of these topics, just like everyone out there, and I'm very excited to hear what we have going on today. I also wanted to say a big hello to a couple of high school classes that we have out there, Friends Select School in Philly, Upper Dauphine Area High School in Elizabethville, Pennsylvania, and Gilderland High School in upstate New York. So welcome to all of you, and we're really thrilled that you're here as well. If there are any other classrooms here, please let me know. But now I'm going to turn it over to Rich. As we heard earlier, Rich is a professor at Wisconsin-Madison. And, and Rich, in technical words, he, he studies crystallizations and, and how things crystallize or how they don't crystallize. And you can imagine that's going to be really important for how we make candy. And so if you want to learn more about this, Rich has several books. So if you're interested in today's conversation, you should check out all of Rich's books that he's written. He has some more technical books on crystallization and food engineering, but he's also got some books written for the, the general learner, Food Bites and Candy Bites. So please check those out if you really enjoy what you hear today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Well, hello, everybody. Where's the chemistry in candy? So I just put a list of a few things here. And as you can imagine, we can't cover everything on this list. But we're going to cover the things that you see highlighted. So we're going to talk about physical state and the texture, structure, uh, functionality of candies. And then we'll finish with a section on, on caramels and talk about color chemistry. So let's talk about Tootsie Rolls. And if you have prepared and brought candy with you, now would be the time to taste that Tootsie Roll. What I want you to do and what I typically do in all my classes is, is have people look at it, poke at it. In this case, you want to pull it apart and see what happens. And then you can taste it. That's OK, too. But you can see here in the slide that the ingredients in Tootsie Roll are sugar and corn syrup. And those are probably the two most common ingredients in most sugar candies, in fact. It's either sugar or corn syrup. That's the number one ingredient. Normally, that's related to whether that candy is crystalline or not. You see some partially hydrogenated soybean oil, condensed skim milk, cocoa, whey, soy lecithin, and some flavors. But you can see from the chemistry side of things, basically we're adding sucrose, a disaccharide, with corn syrup, which is a glucose polymer that comes from corn starch hydrolysis. And then we add other things, like lipids and proteins, in this case flavors are actually going to generate by the cooking process. Now, as you've tasted this, keep it in mind, because we're going to have a final exam on Tootsie Rolls. So let's talk about how candy's made. This is a general process, basically mixing sugar and corn syrup. We usually add excess water when we do it here in the lab, because we need to make sure that the sugar is dissolved. Phase diagram of sucrose is pretty interesting. Once it starts boiling, you'd think that everything would dissolve by then. But no, the boiling point curve actually crosses over the solubility curve. So once you start boiling, if you haven't dissolved all your crystals, you better hope you're getting a crystalline candy. Other things that we add, so milk, fats, hydrocolloids, colors, flavors, acids, all the things that go into making different candies unique. Sometimes they're added before cooking. Sometimes they're added after cooking, depending on the process. Then we boil the candy, so we boil that sugar mass. It's a sugar solution. And as we heat it to boil, we start boiling off water, which makes it more concentrated, which actually raises the boiling temperature. So in effect, as we boil out a sugar syrup, we're following the boiling point elevation curve upwards. And the, the relationship between boiling temperature and water is actually what the candy maker uses to identify when to stop cooking. Once we've reached the right temperature, that means we've reached the right water content, then we cool, process, and form. That may be aeration as in a marshmallow. It may be crystallization as in fondant and fudge. It may be pulling on taffy hook or something like that. When you make candy at home, you use a candy thermometer, or at least many people do. And what's interesting about the candy thermometer is it's got these milestones, so to speak, at different temperature points. You might ask, well, what do those milestones really mean? 
and what's the difference between a firm ball and a hard crack. So let's go through that. It's related to temperature, but it's also related to texture. And I could talk through the slide, but it's easier to watch sugar boil. So this is something we do a lot in candy class. We sit and watch sugar boil. So there's a thermometer in there, uh, and we're measuring temperature. But what I'm going to do is pull sugar syrup out with a wooden spoon, not with my fingers like an old-time candy maker, and drop it into cold water. And so you can see the temperature there. You can see what happens when I drop that sugar syrup at 230 degrees into, uh, into that water. Basically, the viscosity of the sugar syrup is, is low enough that it all just disperses back into, uh, into the water. At 240, though, you can see it's starting to hold its shape a little better. So the integrity of that uh, sugar mass in the cold water is enough so that I can reach down and scoop out some sugar at the bottom uh, and pull it together, and, uh, and that's called uh, the soft ball state. So I could form it into a ball, but it was so soft that it just flowed. And there's some candies that, uh, that fit that requirement. Uh, so the center of a, a, a cordial cherry is one. Now we're up a bit higher in temperature, uh, and again, you can see specific strands of sugar material. And when I pull it up off the bottom, uh, I can form a ball, uh, and this one is firm. It doesn't deform under the weight of gravity, uh, but it's easy for me to, to manipulate and push around, uh, just like a caramel, right? So that, water, that uh, candy makes a, a caramel. That cooking to that temperature makes a caramel. Now we're up to 260, and uh, when I take it out and pour it into the water, Again, you see these firm strands, but they're now much more defined than they were at the start. You can see them standing up against the weight of gravity like that. But when I pull them out, I can still move them and form a ball out of it, although that's now a hard ball. So again, what we're doing is cooking off water, so the viscosity of that sugar syrup is going up, and then when we pour it into the, into the water, uh, it has the integrity to retain that shape. Now we're up in the 280s. Uh, we're in the soft crack state. Look at the shape of those, of those strands. Uh, looks pretty solid, doesn't it? Uh, again, related to the viscosity, but when I pull it out, you can see individual strands, but I can still push that together. So they're, not, uh, they're, they're pliable enough that I can still push them and mold them and, and form them. So we call that the soft crack state. But here we are at 307. Pour it in cold water, that hot sugar syrup at 300 and some degrees, cools down quickly to, to room temperature and forms it into a sugar glass. And that glass now I can break and it shatters. Uh, and that's what a hard crack is. And that's what a hard candy is. So hard candy is nothing more than sugar boiled up to uh, a very high temperature so it becomes a glass. So let's think about what that means, right? If I have 65% sugar in solution, those molecules are floating around, on the, as in the top picture here. You can see there's relatively few sugar molecules and relatively a lot of water molecules. And so this is liquid sugar. It's pretty low viscosity, easy to pour. If we increase the concentration of sugar and decrease the water content, as we just did in that candy thermometer exercise, let's say we get up to 10 to 15 percent or 5 to 15 percent water. That's where we're into the hard ball and soft crack state. So it was really viscous, but it was still deformable. And so because it's viscous, it's, we call it an amorphous liquid. So it's fluid, but it's like a caramel. It moves around. You can push it, but uh, it holds, can hold its shape under the weight of gravity. When we get up to less than 5% water, now we're so concentrated that the viscosity is high enough that we've actually exceeded the glass transition temperature. And this, this is really a second-order tr phase transition. Water molecules can move around a little bit, but basically the sugar molecules are kind of set in space, but not in a crystal lattice. They're set in as a amorphous, uh, kind of frozen in space type, uh, type system. So a sugar glass is also amorphous because of the random nature of the, the molecules, uh, but because it's exceeded its glass transition temperature, we call it a glass. So hard candy is a sugar glass. So it's defined as uh, where we have that uh, transition from, from being more fluid-like to being more solid-like, although a physicist would say it's still a liquid because the molecules are, are still in random shape, but it's got the mechanical properties that make it seem like a solid. So you can see the viscosity is very high. It can easily withstand the force of gravity. And things that affect that glass transition temperature are the types of sugars. So each sugar has a slightly different glass transition temperature depending on its molecular orientation. The molecular weight of that sugar, particularly of a sugar series, a polymer series like a glucose polymer, 
So the higher the molecular weight, the higher the glass transition temperature. And water acts like a plasticizer, so the more water we add, the lower that glass transition temperature. Another way to look at it is if you're at high water content, high temperature, the viscosity is, is low, it's like a liquid, but the diffusivity or a measure of how easily those molecules move around is really high. As we lower water content as we just did and lower temperature as we just did, that liquid becomes more and more viscous and the diffusivity decreases accordingly. So in this, this range, the viscosity or the diffusivity is inversely proportional to viscosity and eventually we reach a water content or t and or temperature combination where that system passes the glass transition and because of the way the molecules are packed together and the limited molecular mobility you don't get sugar crystallization even though it's really highly supersaturated we don't get sugar crystallization because of the molecular mobility to demonstrate that I'm going to use peeps I don't know if any of you brought peeps along with you but here's the ingredient list sugar corn syrup gelatin and then a few other things air is more than half the volume of a marshmallow although it doesn't make up much mass. So sugar and corn syrup and then gelatin is there to actually help hold the air bubbles together. So this is an example of an amorphous candy. When we pull that marshmallow peep apart, it stretches because of the gelatin that's in that matrix. And so you can see there's an amorphous sugar matrix with air bubbles inside. And that's what essentially the, the structure of a marshmallow is. If you look closer between the air bubbles, that's where the gelatin is. It unfolds at the surface of the air bubble. And then if you look at this under an electron microscope, you can see the air bubbles and the amorphous phase. And so here you can see all of those together. Everybody knows when you put something in liquid nitrogen. So I've seen Tigon tubes. I've seen roses put in liquid nitrogen. But my favorite is a peep. If you look at this website, peepresearch.org, these are people with too much time on their hands, but they have some pretty nice pictures of peeps after they've been in liquid nitrogen and how they shatter from that. And so what's happening is the glass transition temperature of a marshmallow because of the high water content is below minus 40 degrees. So we have to get it colder than that to get it to turn into a glass. Uh, but interestingly, you can see from also, also from this that uh, those people, those of you that like to open the package of peeps and let them harden before you eat it, what's happening is it's losing moisture and as it loses moisture its glass transition temperature goes up causing it to be uh, harder and harder. And so what you're doing really is playing with candy chemistry. So we can categorize confections based on their crystalline state. So we're going to talk about hard candy and caramel, both ungrained confections. Go ahead and, and uh, taste the Lifesaver and Jolly Rancher. My suggestion is you do the Jolly Rancher first and then move to the Lifesaver. And while you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit about our candy and sugar glass, right? So as we've just learned, a heart candy is cooked to the hard crack state somewhere around 300, 305 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it's cooled quickly. And so the molecules of sugar, even though they're highly concentrated, don't crystallize because we've exceeded the glass transition condition before crystallization can occur. So cooling is a faster process than crystallization. Because of the uh, molecular arrangement of sugars in there, the colors and flavors are distributed uniformly throughout. So if you were to break it in, in a part uh, or look at the, the pieces of it, uh, the color and the flavor would be distributed uniformly because there's still space between the sugar molecules. Uh, and that's distinct from a, a, a rock candy where the color is just on the surface. In fact, sugar glasses used to be used in the old westerns, so that's not a sugar glass. That's actually a polyurethane breakaway glass. But in older westerns, they actually did use a sugar glass to allow the, the bad guys to get whacked over the head with a, of the bottle or, or somebody to get thrown through the window and not have to worry about being cut. Right? So the problem with, with real glass, window glass, is that the silica molecules have a glass transition temperature that's, that's well higher than that of a hard candy. And, uh, and so it's really sharp and, uh, and the edges are sufficient to uh, draw blood. And that's why your mo mother says don't play with glass because if you break it, uh, it can, can cause all kinds of problems, right? But interestingly, that's what uh, a sugar glass was used for in the old days. Uh, they were s not stable because they pick up humidity, they pick up water even in relatively low humidities. Uh, and then, of course, when it warmed up during the day, it would start to sag and they would lose all the characteristics of it. 
So let's look at the sugar profile in a hard candy. So we add sucrose together with corn syrup, and corn syrup is a mixture of glucose polymers from a degree of polymerization of one all the way up to 15 to 20 or so. We've only got listed here malt, up to maltose, which is a DP of two, and then the higher saccharides are, are three through 15 or so. And you can see here that this particular study of European hard candies, by the way, showed a range of water contents, a range of fructose content, and most hard candies do not have fructose added, and so the fructose content comes from inversion of the sucrose at high temperatures. They, uh, that sucrose molecule hydrolyzes leaving a mole of glucose and fructose for each mole of sucrose. And so that fructose, the candy that had 8.6% fructose was one that sat around for a long time at high temperatures and probably will have some problems associated with it. Interestingly, it's this mixture of saccharides plus the water content that determine the glass transition temperature of that hard candy. I like looking at things from a cartoon standpoint, so to speak, and so this is my cartoon of heart candy, and you can see uh, the various components of it. There's sucrose molecules, there's some glucose and fructose molecules that come from the inversion, and then there's the starch hydrolysates, so starch molecules can either be straight chain amylose molecules that are broken down, or branch chain amylopectin molecules, all glucose polymers broken down to different sizes, and then packed together with a very low water content. So you could imagine that the ability of any of these molecules to move around is pretty limited, and also there's strong hydrogen bonding interactions among all of those molecules as well. And so the stability of a hard candy is dependent on that glass transition temperature. So they have different types of sugars and different water content. And so each of the hard candies out in the marketplace would have a slightly different glass transition temperature. So here's an example of several different hard candies, their moisture content and the glass transition temperatures. And generally anything that has a glass transition temperature above room temperature is glass. If it's glass transition temperature is below room temperature, of course, it's no longer a glass, it's heading towards the amorphous or even fluid side. So you can see all of these candies have glass transition temperatures above uh, room temperature, but there's one in particular that's dangerously close to room temperature. So here's a list of things that you should have found different. So the Jolly Rancher has a better flavor release because it's got the lower glass transition temperature. And the hardness, brittleness, crunchiness also goes hand in hand with glass transition. And so again, Lifesaver has a higher glass transition. It's harder to bite into, uh, but breaks cleaner as opposed to the kind of chewiness of, of a Jolly Rancher. And then the end of shelf life is very different. So the Jolly Rancher, as you saw in the quiz, was one that sometimes you have to peel the wrapper off because its glass transition temperature is so low. The surface is hygroscopic, picks up a little bit of moisture, and the surface would go below the glass transition temperature, making it sticky. And so moisture uptake is the problem with Jolly Ranchers, but actually flavor loss is important in both. So there's a little bit about hard candy. So how are Pop Rocks made? So it's actually a hard candy with CO2 bubbles at 600 PSI embedded in the glassy matrix. So here you can see some pictures of pop rocks under polarized light microscope. You can see the outline of the hard candy matrix, but within that hard candy matrix you see these, these uh, roundish bubbles, and these are actually CO2 bubbles at 600 PSI. So when you put this in your mouth and the saliva dissolves away this glassy sugar matrix, eventually you reach a point where the matrix that's holding that 600 PSI is no longer capable of doing that, and then the bubble pops. So interesting product. This one actually has lactose added to increase the hardness because lactose actually has a higher glass transition temperature than sucrose. So that's Pop Rocks, a little bit of extra there. So let's finish by talking quickly about caramel. So caramel is a dairy candy. It's about the only one that's got dairy added. And so it's corn syrup, sugar, some milk, some palm oil, butter's in there, whey's in there. So you can see this particular one has been cost reduced. Instead of using sweetened condensed milk and, and butter fat, it's got a few other ingredients in there. But basically it's an amorphous sugar matrix with an emulsion of fat globules. And then these little circles around the fat globules are casing micelles that form structures as we heat it. Uh, there's whey proteins in milk as well, but they don't form at the interface. They may actually interact with casein micelles and cause some, uh, some issues. But that's what a caramel is. But I'll ask you what causes the browning reaction. There's two classes of browning reactions. 
There's caramelization, which is a, a reaction at elevated temperatures where the sugar, where reducing sugars undergo a dehydration reaction, and that initiates a whole series of different steps that leads to various flavors and polymeric colors or, or melanoidins. Mayor browning, on the other hand, is uh, usually something that uh, goes at lower temperatures, but you need proteins to add to react with the reducing sugars, and once those proteins react with the reducing sugars, you get to essentially the same point in the reaction process as caramelization. Mayart browning, Mayart comes from this fellow here, Louis Mayart, chemist back in the early 1900s who first understood this chemical reaction and all the complexities of the steps involved, and so the reaction was named after him. So Mayart browning again is a reaction between reducing sugars and proteins that produces classic aromas that depend on the initial materials. So other examples of Mayart browning reaction would be the browning on the toast. Actually, meat browning is an example of that. Cocoa bean roasting is another as well. So you can see here the general path of the, the reaction, uh, and it's pretty complex. So there's a number of different steps, and not surprisingly, because there's a number of different steps, there's a number of different things that can influence what the final products are. So here's a list of things that distinguish between coffee roasting and, and caramel and chocolate roasting. So mostly it comes down to the nature of the substrate, so what types of reducing sugars and their concentrations do you have? What types of proteins or amine sources do you have as well? So it's those substrates that start the reaction. The general path of the reaction then can be influenced by things like water content, temperature content, and pH. So all of those things are, are things that influence that reaction and, and govern the flavors and, and color effect that comes from, from those reactions. Caramelization, on the other hand, will occur without proteins, but you need to go to higher temperatures to get that to go. There's some interesting research going on at the University of Illinois on sugar caramelization and how apparently it's not as simple as, as we think. So this is a reaction of reducing sugars again, produces colors and flavors and other products that are very similar to those that come from Mayard Browning. So in fact, it's often very difficult to distinguish whether a caramel has been made by a caramelization reaction or by a Mayard Browning reaction. So caramelization is also influenced by the types and concentrations of sugars. Again, you need reducing sugars to do this, but sucrose actually works even though it's not a reducing sugar because at those high temperatures it inverts or hydrolyzes, creating fructose and glucose, which are both reducing sugars, and then the reaction goes. Temperature, again, you need high temperatures, water content, and pH. You can see here some pictures of sugar syrups boiling and changing in, in color. You kind of could see that in our... Uh, candy thermometer example as well. But here's a really good example. I spent a couple hours one afternoon, one hand stirring one pot with uh, just sugar and corn syrup, and the other hand stirring another pot where I had a little bit of evaporated milk. And they followed the same temperature time protocol, and I took samples every 10 degrees so that you could see what uh, influence the protein has. So it's really remarkable that even at 260 degrees, sugar and corn syrup have essentially no additional color because there's no protein, so there's no Mayard browning. It's only once you hit 270 or 280 that you start getting caramelization, whereas at 260, that protein effect is uh, giving a really, really brown type of color. There's a couple ways of cooking caramels, and the way I learned to make caramel was the commercial way, where we just mix everything together in a pot, heat it up slowly to the right temperature to get the right water content, uh, and so all the protein and reducing sugars together. And so basically the color and flavor that comes from that is based on Mayer Browning. But I have a couple chefs that have worked in my lab over the past few years, and, and they have a different way of doing it. So they brown the sugars first. So they put sugar into a pot and heat it up to 350 Fahrenheit or something like that. And once they've got the right brown color, and they don't measure temperature either. They just look at, at what it looks like. And then they add the cream. And then you have to heat it back up again to 115 to 118 to get the right water content. But there the color is primarily based on caramelization. There's a little bit of Mayard browning at the end, but these can sometimes give very different flavors of caramel. It's interesting to look at the chemistry of it and see what you find. We've covered the physical state and texture structure, and we've covered some reaction chemistry, uh, but there are a lot of more things that we could have played with. And flavor chemistry and color chemistry is actually a pretty interesting area, as is rubber chemistry applied to chewing and bubble gum. So there's really a lot of places where chemistry comes into candy. But how is uh, candy corn made? 
So candy corn, as you can see in the background of this slide, I have some faded out pictures of candy corn. Candy corn is what we call a mallow cream. So it's basically made from crystalline sugar that's got uh, some kind of gelling agent added to it. Often that's gelatin or something like that. And it's aerated as well. And so it's a candy mass kind of similar to chocolate covered raspberry cream or something like that. So the process is essentially the same, but the manufacturing process is actually really interesting. How do you make a shape like that with three different colors? Well, the way to do it is to press a depression into some cornstarch. So imagine a bed of cornstarch that's been flattened on the top, and then you press these uh, triangular shapes into it so you have a mold and then you deposit some liquid candy. So first you deposit white, let it set just a second, then you deposit the orange, let it set just a second, then you deposit the yellow, and the top of the yellow is the top of the mold. And then if you've done it right, they melt together without bleeding together, and then the next day you can shake them out of the starch and actually polish them a little bit with some kind of wax to give that shiny appearance. Rich, that was a great talk. This is fantastic. You know, there have been so many great questions that have come along. I want to ask real quickly about candies with sugar substitutes. How do you get your candies to set up the way you want them to when you don't add sugar? Sugar substitutes in the confectionery industry are typically done with sugar alcohols. So asorbitol or maltitol or something like that is typically what is used to replace sugar, so it's a sugar alcohol, so it responds in your body different. It's got a lower calorie content, also lower sweetness. Sometimes it has a laxative effect as well because your body doesn't absorb it. That's typically how we make uh, sugar-free candies. So if you go to the store and buy a sugar-free hard candy, it's probably made with something like isomalt, which is a hydrogenated uh, sucrose uh, molecules, or maltitol. But basically, it's made in the same way. They have slightly different properties, so their glass transition temperatures are different, their crystallization properties are different, but essentially all the things we know about sugar apply to polyols as well. Interestingly, though, with a sugar-free, you have to add high-intensity sweeteners because they don't have enough sweetness, so something like sucralose or ACE-K or something like that is added. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I, I think that was great. Uh, we've also had several questions on resources for putting candy science into general classrooms. And I, I had a brief answer. The ACS has a couple of really nice resources. The Journal of Chemical Education is one. But also to go along with that, I think a lot of the questions that we won't get to today can even be handled by this too. Rich's book, Candy Bites, has encyclopedic the knowledge that, that, that is in there. There are all these questions on candy corn, and I was thinking, well, there's a whole chapter in Rich's book on candy corn. <laughs> we're, we're not going to be able to get to everybody today, but I, I do encourage you to go out there and, and purchase this. Rich, I'm wondering if, if you know anything about 3D printing with sugars and what transitions the sugar needs to go through to enable that and, and how that all works and, and sort of what the final state of the sugar is. That's an interesting question because we were just discussing that in my lab group last week, even to the point of toying with the idea of, of buying one just to play with it and see what we could do. So I have some skepticism about the things we can do with 3D printing because of the phase transitions that have to happen to get the structures that we want in foods. So it's, it's easy enough for certain things, but I think some things it's going to be very, very difficult to do. Boy, some of the complex structures that we see in, like a marshmallow, I don't see how that's going to happen in a 3D printer. It really is amazing. Can you comment on perhaps what factor you think is more important for flavor release? Is it candy shape or the glass transition temperature? Well, if you think about it, what signals release of flavor in your mouth? It has to do with how that piece breaks up. And if it's a hard candy, you have to dissolve it away. And the harder to dissolve it away it is, the, more, the slower the flavor is. So there the glass transition temperature is very important. In other confections, it may not be nearly as important. And how you bite and how you break the structures is much more important in how the flavor comes up. So remember, when we talk about it as flavor, but really it's aroma. So we have to break that structure, allow those flavor molecules to come release into the air, and then that to transcend up into your nasal cavity where you, where you actually smell it, right? So it's a combination of that aroma and then whatever sense buds you have on your tongue that interact with things like sweetness and sourness. So it's a really complex set of things. The important question is how does that product break up in your mouth?
Okay, thank you. Can you describe for our audience the, the state of sugar in cotton candy? So what's going on with cotton candy? Oh yeah, that's an easy one. And if you're here for my regular talk, I'd have cotton candy made for you by now. <laughs> so to make cotton candy, you take crystalline sugar, and that crystalline sugar has colors and flavors embedded on the surface or adsorbed on the surface, right? So it looks like it's colored sugar, but it's only stuff on the surface. You pour that into the center of the cotton candy machine, and it's a spinning machine that has a heating element inside. And basically, it heats that sugar up above its melting point. So you're going into a molten liquid state at above 190 degrees C as the sugar melts. Now you have a liquid inside that spinner, and because there's holes on the, on the edges of the spinner, that liquid is centrifugally blown out of those holes into these fine strands or floss. And as soon as it comes out, it cools down to room temperature, and so it goes down below the glass transition temperature, and it sets up into a glassy state almost immediately. However, because the strands are so thin, you can they don't break, they don't shatter, you can actually collect them on a, on a cone and make a cotton candy cone. But because of the high surface area, it's really prone to picking up moisture. So again, what I do in class is I make a, a cone of cotton candy and then I set it down on the cotton candy spinner, continue my talk and come back to how it picked up moisture, the moisture diluted things, and then it eventually recrystallized. Okay. So we have a, a question from one of our high schools in Philly. And the question is, is how are gushers made? <laughs> uh, with a proprietary technology. <laughs> I've asked them that. <laughs> so there's a number of ways that you could embed a liquid inside a basically a jelly candy. So that jelly candy, the outside is a flavored sugar solution that's firmed into a gel by some kind of gelling agent. Often it's gelatin, sometimes it's gelatin plus starch, and pectin might be in there as well. And so you need that firmness to give the texture that you're looking for, but somehow you've got to put that liquid inside. So there's a number of ways to do it, and again, I don't know exactly how gushers are made, but you can find hard candies that are made with liquid centers as well. And basically they're pulled into a rope, and then inside that rope of hard candy would be, while well, still plastic material, would be pumped the liquid center, uh, and then it's pulled into a, a long rope. Uh, so imagine a snake of a certain one inch thickness or so, and then it goes into a cutting device that actually crimps the edges, keeping the liquid inside. I don't know if that's how they make gushers or not. Okay. Uh, along the lines of candies with multiple textures, can you talk a little bit about chocolate covered cherries? Oh yeah, I could talk about that all day. Yeah. <laughs> so actually it's one of the exam questions I use in my candy class, right? How, how do you get that liquid center in the middle? There's actually multiple ways that you can do it, but the most common one, if you look at the ingredient list of a cordial cherry, you see this magic ingredient called invertase. Invertase is an enzyme that breaks down sucrose into glucose and fructose. The way uh, I've seen it made, so the plant that I visited, made a really hard fondant with a cherry inside, through depositing means, and then enrobed that piece with chocolate. But they had the, the fondant so firm that it could uh, go through an enrober and be coated in chocolate. And then over time, the invertase broke down the sugar in solution, changed the phase equilibrium, eventually you end up with that liquid center as the invertase breaks down the sucrose. Okay. In some of the candies that do set up and, and harden, what size are the crystals in these candies when they start to, to push out water? Is there, is there some sort of gauge that you can give us for, for sort of texture that we feel in, in crystal size? So there's a standard threshold detection limit that we throw about in the industry. I'm not sure that we have a really good study that documents it, but typically we say in most sugar candies, that critical threshold size is between 15 and 20 microns. So the same applies for chocolate, which is two-thirds of chocolate is actually particles, including sugar crystals. And if those particles are bigger than approximately 20 microns or there's enough big ones, then you can start feeling it in your mouth. So a, a really good chocolate would have particles that are less than 15 microns, nothing above 20 microns. So good question. That's a sensory question. And, and actually, while I'm at it, I guess I would encourage you to do another candy experiment, but this time on chocolate, and get two chocolates. So probably the, the two best are chocolate chip, and I would recommend a Dove Promise, and then taste those and see if you can feel the grittiness in your mouth and think about what those particles might be like. Excellent. I think we're all going to go out and try that one later.
<laughs> um, can, can you comment on viscosity? You started this presentation showing the different states of sugar when you're heating it up. And, and maybe talk about how that viscosity comes about from organization or polymerization. And, and I, you know, I know where this answer is going, but then can you maybe talk about polymerization and caramels? Sure. If you're here in front of me do it, and, I would, and I have my props with me, I would have five different jars of different fluids from an invert sugar syrup, which has just monosaccharides, to a 3060E corn syrup, which has a degree of polymerization probably in the, in the 10 to 15 range. I'm not exactly sure. So glucose polymers of DP1 versus DP15. And the 3060E corn syrup I can turn over and it takes minutes before it starts to flow, whereas the invert sugar, which is monosaccharides, it's a little bit more viscous than water, but not that much more. So it relates to how the molecules flow across each other. So in a solution of sugars like that, the water molecules are abundant and then the sugar molecules are distributed throughout. And as you pour it, you shear, that, uh, you shear those molecules and how easily those molecules flow across each other is what determines how viscous it is. And the bigger the molecules they are, the more trouble they have flowing across each other and so the more viscous it is. So that relates directly to the degree of polymerization. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I think we're going to go with one or two, maybe maybe two more questions. But let me get this one from our class in New York. When you eat a gobstopper, a gobstopper, you put it in your mouth. It's really hard. It'll crack your teeth. But after, when when it's done, it it falls apart. Can you tell us why a gobstopper gets soft in your mouth at the very end? I know I have some gobstoppers here in my office somewhere. <laughs> so gobstoppers are an interesting candy. Gobstoppers are one of those things that you can play with and demonstrate some science principles. So the classic experiment with gobstoppers is to get a petri dish, half an inch of water in there, and put four different colored gobstoppers in the four different quadrants and watch. <laughs> and as the water dissolves the sugar, the dyes, the colors that are in there are released and they form some interesting patterns and there's some interesting science in that. But a gobstopper is made by what's called a hard panning process, so it's rotating in a pan, a tulip-shaped pan that's turned tumbling around and around, and the pieces are, are being picked up by the pan, and then once they reach the right point in the trajectory, they fall down by gravity. And when we pour a spray sugar syrup over the top, and the sugar syrup crystallizes to form a really hard layer. And so a gobstopper is built up by... I don't know, hundreds of different sprays of sugar and crystallizing layers of sugar and with different colors as you go along. I think what's in the center is, is actually a tablet confection. So it's something like a piece of Pez, although different in, in texture and, and I think it's even different in composition. But it's not quite a hard candy inside there. That's what you're feeling once you've uh, broken through all of the crystalline layers. Excellent. Thank you. Can you tell us just real briefly about the difference between beet sugar and cane sugar and, and even you know, how, the, how they might be processed differently and used differently? So we get sugar from either the sugar cane or the sugar beet. The sugar cane grows in tropical areas, temperate areas. In the U.S. it's grown in Louisiana, maybe some still in, in Florida, whereas beets are grown in northern climates, so Minnesota and North Dakota are pretty common. Where I went to school in Colorado, there was a big sugar beet factory just down the road. But they are different plants and basically the process of, of getting the sugar out is to cut them into small bite-sized pieces and then extract the sugars out with hot water. But you also extract out all the other stuff that's in the plant, tannins and saccharides and things like that. And so the rest of the process of making table sugar is refining it, so concentrating it and refining, taking out all of the impurities as much as you can and separating out just uh, pure sugar crystals. The processes are slightly different because the impurities are different, but the end point is approximately the same. It's a sugar crystal that's 99.99% .99 sucrose, but there's a small percentage of impurities that are left. In fact, molasses is nothing more than the impurities from which the last bit of refined sugar has been taken. But when we eat molasses, it's from the cane sugar. The beet sugar molasses is really gross. It smells a lot. It's really ugly and dirty because it's got a lot more impurities in it. And actually, some of those impurities are still coated on the surface of each sugar crystal. So we separate with a centrifuge, but then we dry it, and whatever liquid was left after centrifugation forms a thin layer of amorphous 
sugar on the surface of the sugar crystal, and that's where the impurities are. However, most people in the candy industry say it doesn't make any difference whether you use cane or beet. Most people in the baking industry say it, it's a big difference, and that difference has to come from the small levels of impurities that are different between the two products. Well, thank you again, Rich. This has been fantastic, and I, I know everyone out there, I think, has enjoyed this webinar greatly, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service of the American Chemical Society as your chemistry source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.